Gary uncovers God's plan for healing your finances, spirit, mind, and emotions. Totally Heal, today on Fixing the Money Thing. I'm Gary Cassie. For nine years I had debt I couldn't pay, which brought on panic attacks, antidepressants, until the kingdom of God drastically changed my life. Now I want to help you fix the money thing. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie, wants to mentor you in the kingdom principles that will set you free. If you put God's principles in place, you will prosper. This is Gary Cassie, Fixing the Money Thing. Genesis chapter 15, we're going to look at this scripture. It's dealing with Abram, who later became Abraham. And I want to point out something to you today. We're going to just kind of bounce off that scripture. That's now you know why I, I could title this, you know, how long are you going to put up with it? I could be the title of the message today. So Abraham, of course, I'll call him Abraham. Abraham, of course, you know, they couldn't have kids. I mean, it wasn't like they needed uh, some kind of therapy or some, some help physically, me medically. They could not have kids. They were already uh, past the age of their body having kids. And so... God had spoken to Abram in Genesis chapter 12 and told him that he, is, he was going to have heirs and that through him all the nations would be blessed. And so we find here in Genesis 15, verse number 1, uh, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. So number one, we have a problem. Uh, not just a problem, an impossibility, right? We have an impossibility. So Abram's wondering, how is this going to take place? I have no kids. I got this servant, according to their law, this servant would be my heir. I mean, we have a problem. So number one, you may have a problem, a problem that's hanging around for a while, a problem you don't see the answer for, or maybe you even say it's impossible, right? Anyone like that? Probably so. Then the word of the Lord, verse 4, came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the heavens, count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So God sent his word. Now you have his word, 7,000 promises, and a promise carries a picture. So you need to ask yourself, what am I looking at? Are you looking at the problem, or are you looking at the God that can do anything? Are you looking at his promise to you? Are you dreaming about that promise? Are you envisioning yourself in that promise? Or are you stuck in the impossibility of that can't happen? Well, I hope, I'll keep praying, maybe God, maybe someday, hopefully. Friend, faith is never hopefully, friend, faith is. In fact, the word hope in the New Testament doesn't mean maybe. It means confident expectation. The Greek word literally means confident expectation. So we expect, when God gives us his promise, we expect it, and we envision ourselves in it. We thus speak about it as something that is ours, and we act on it with authority. All right, so God's telling him, this, this isn't going to be, this isn't the case. Well, I don't know if I can pay my bills. Well, there's scriptures that tell you you can't. It's just as if God spoke to you and said, no, that's not your future, Abram, he's not your future. A son coming from your own flesh will be your future. It's impossible, I know that, but that's what the case is. And that's what God says to you, right? Right, all right. Then it goes on, so Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now he also said to him, God said to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I'll gain possession of this? And the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Uh, so, verse 17. When the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to your, your descendants, I'll give this land. So let's talk about this. So God gave him his promise, and now God gives him his oath. 
It's like, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy your house. That's the promise. Now let's sign a contract. A covenant is a binding contract between two parties that lays out the specifications of what the responsibility of both parties are and the benefits thereof. Now in that day, when they made a contract, a covenant, they, they, in that day, they split animals in half. And they would walk between the animals and make their vow. What they were saying was, as this dead animal is, I shall be if I violate what I tell you. Basically, paraphrased, I give you my life. On my life, I will fulfill this vow to you. Does that make sense? You got that? So, on my life, I tell you I will fulfill. If it takes, I'll do all, everything I can. I give my life to this. I will guarantee with my life this is going to happen. That's what they did to make covenant. Now, that, that still exists. You'll find in our contracts the word covenants that explain things in our contracts, even today. And you'll find, uh, you may hear someone say, my life is on the line. You know that phrase, uh, their life, you know, the line they're talking about is not a line in the sand. It's a line they signed. They're going to put their life on the line, a police officer. What does that mean? When they sign the agreement to be a police officer, they put their life on their vow, on the line, their promise. That's the same thing that happens when that covenant's made. They put their life on the line, their life to back that up. We still use, you ever heard cut, cut a deal? I'm going to cut a deal. That's, that goes back to that old covenant-making process. They're gonna, you're going to cut a deal or strike a bargain. Uh, it's uh, phrases that come out of that old uh, that concept of, of covenant-making. But nevertheless, it's a binding thing. So uh, Abram said, how shall I know that I'll have it? Even though God said it, they made covenant, basically made contract that he'd have it. Okay, you got that? Now, verse 11 says something very interesting, and let's take a look at that. So let's start with verse 10. He brought all the animals cut them in two, arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Verse 11 says, Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. Now, this is what you have to do. The enemy is going to try to interfere with, with you and the promises God has. God didn't drive those birds of prey away. You have to. Abram had to. You're going to have to say no. You're going to have to bind that thing. You're going to have to fight that. You're going to have to cast aside those doubts, those thoughts that come against what God says. It's up to you to keep that thing off you, to keep uh, what Satan wants to cause in your life, to cause a distraction, uh, a delay. You're the one that has to exercise your authority against the enemy. Because if you don't, he's going to interfere with this thing and get involved with these promises and this, this contract, and it's going to get, it's get kind of blurry. Okay? Help me out now. Okay. I want you to say the word stagnant. I believe so many people are living a stagnant life. What I mean by that is they have ideas, they have dreams, they have visions. God even spoke to them. Uh, they're in church, they're praying, but they're stagnant. Nothing's happening. They don't have the evidence. They don't see things moving forward. They're stagnant. And what happens is you begin to adapt to that stagnation, and you begin, it's, it's kind of a way of life, and you, get, uh, you lose vision, you lose clarity, and uh, you, you have to take authority over that. 